Hello, and welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. I'm Karen Snape with Virginia Cooperative Extension, and this week we're going to learn about some flowering trees that are native or near native to Virginia. I've taken some video throughout the past couple of months. Anytime I saw something blooming, I uh, went back later to fill in some of the details, and I hope that you'll enjoy this and learn a little bit about some of the native or near native flowering trees that you might find in the woods of Virginia or that you might consider for a specimen landscape tree. Here are the flowers of some black locust. You can see the black locust has a compound leaf made of several leaflets and it also has thorns along the stem which I don't think I'm going to be able to show you. They will have thorns, but here are the flowers. They're just really, uh, they're big, they're white, they're shaped like pea flowers, and indeed black locust is in the legume family. It's a nitrogen fixer, which makes it a really effective uh, pioneer species, an early successional species that will come in on land that perhaps has been um, degraded for some reason, uh, clear cuts, abandoned pastures, abandoned um, construction type sites. And these white flowers are uh, highly prized by bees, making the black locust uh, really prized by beekeepers. And black locust is also really good for fence posts and things like that because the wood is very rot resistant. Um, other than that, it doesn't form a good timber species unless you're looking for uh, fence post material. It also smells, I think, like grapes. And here we have the flowers of the black cherry or wild cherry. You can see these long sprays of little white flowers, five petaled. I don't see any bees on them right now. There was a fly a moment ago. Flies are also pollinators. These will ripen into very small little dark cherries. Um, they are edible, but they are mostly pit and rather tart. Black cherry leaves are simple, finely serrated. Often on the back side, they'll have a little bit of orange fuzz along the midrib. This one doesn't have it, but sometimes you'll see that. And if you crush the leaf or if you kind of scrape uh, the stem or the bark with your thumb, that inner bark will smell like um, cyanide, like bitter almond, because there is some cyanide um, in that, which is why a lot of people don't like to have it around their cattle or horses. But it had medicinal uses uh, by the Native Americans. This is the Kentucky coffee bean tree. And I've never seen the flowers before. I just happened to walk by at the right time today. Um, six petaled, uh, whitish to greenish. So those flowers we looked at first were six petaled, but these actually appear to be 10 petaled or five petaled with five prominent sepals, which are the petal-like structures in the back of the flower. Large clusters of these. Really different, really striking. Here are some more of those Kentucky coffee tree blooms. And these will produce really big fat bean pods when they mature. And as implied by the name, those can be um, processed correctly and used to produce a beverage. So here is a uh, mature Kentucky coffee tree. I'm actually at McCormick Farm in Augusta County. And you can see the fruits that matured from those flowers that I videoed early. And we'll take a closer look at some I was able to collect off of the yard. So these are two of those bean pods that came off of the Kentucky coffee tree. These are not matured. They, uh, 
they fell off of the tree before they plumped up with seeds. But this is how big they are and what they look like. And all of this is one leaf from a Kentucky coffee tree. So this is a double compound leaf. Um, all of this came out of one leaf bud. Um, this is where it attached to the main stem of the tree. And you can see that it is made up of little leaflets on little leaf stems. And those little leaf stems are on a big leaf stem. And so all of this is one leaf. This is one of the biggest leaves that you'll find um, on, we'll say near native trees um, around in Virginia. Um, interestingly, the leaflets actually are alternate on the rachis, which is unusual as well. Um, Yellowwood does that, but usually the leaflets are opposite of each other, even if the um, twigs and the leaves, the whole leaves, are alternate like in a hickory. And I recently realized that Kentucky coffee tree is not quite exactly native to Virginia. I'm going to call it near native, um, certainly native to the um, east of the Rocky Mountains, United States. And uh, the range has ex been expanded uh, into Virginia. Here we have a buckeye. Buckeyes are also sometimes called horse chestnuts, although to be a purist about it, you're probably going to call the American varieties, the American species, um, buckeyes and the Eurasian ones, horse chestnuts, but you know, uh, there's some overlap there. Interestingly, they have a palmately compound leaf. So these five leaflets are all coming off of the same spot instead of off of a central midrib, and that's palmately compound, like how your fingers all come off of your palm of your hand. And these buckeyes are in bloom here, and I um, have never really noticed the blossoms before because these were not common where I lived up until about a year ago. But uh, large clusters of these really very pretty yellow and red flowers and uh, these trees will um, mature to produce um, buckeyes, a, a conker, uh, looks like a nut. So I hunted around a little bit and I found a number of these uh, husks from the buckeye con conkers. Um, the conker is more like a nut that would be inside of there. This might remind you a little bit of a walnut husk or a hickory husk. And it's the same kind of concept here with the buckeye. Uh, horse chestnut husk is going to be um, a little bit spiny uh, instead. This is one of the most striking native flowering trees to Virginia. This is the tulip poplar, also called yellow poplar or tulip tree. And you can see where it gets that tulip moniker because the blooms look a lot like tulips. You might not see these very often because they grow to be some of the tallest trees in our forests and they're very good at self pruning. And so you won't see very many lower branches in a woodland setting. Uh, on which to observe these flowers, which are normally much higher up. You may be more familiar with the single, somewhat winged seeds that mature from the center of the flower and later fall on the ground. Tulip poplar also has this unusual four-lobed leaf. This one has kind of two extra little uh, Sublobes, it's pretty normal to have uh, more like six, but four uh, lobed leaf. And uh, some people compare this to a cat's face. And the tree itself will grow very straight and very tall, which makes it a really good timber tree. And here's one of those winged seeds of the tulip poplar tree that you might see on the ground under the tulip poplar tree. And this is 
sort of the central spike that was in the center of the flower, in the center of that cone-like structure where the seeds are arranged. So these are things that you may find on the ground. Um, evidence of the flower that was on the tree that was perhaps too high up for you to see. These seeds can stay viable in the ground for 20 years or more, uh, which is a, a really good thing because you have a, a clear cut or some kind of natural disturbance and those tulip poplars can spring up and take advantage of the full sunlight conditions from the seed source uh, already in the ground. And here we have a catalpa tree. And you can see the catalpa blooms are white and kind of bell-shaped, pretty large. Uh, they're white, but they do have some purple and a little bit of uh, orange or gold color inside. And they're in these clusters on the ends of the branches. The uh, catalpa leaf is heart-shaped, sometimes a little bit fuzzy on the bottom, but not a lot fuzzy. And um, interestingly, they are opposite of each other or even whirled. So you may have three, three leaves coming off in a spot instead of just two. So opposite or whirled, heart-shaped, clusters of white bell-shaped flowers. Um, when not in bloom, you might confuse this with the uh, invasive polonia tree or princess tree, but those flowers are purple. The leaves are usually even bigger, definitely fuzzy, um, and even more heart-shaped. And then catalpa also gets these bean pods on it. This is the fruit of the catalpa, these long skinny bean pods. There's a northern catalpa and a southern catalpa. They are similar enough that we're not going to bother with the distinction. Neither is technically native to Virginia. The southern catalpa is native to like Alabama and Mississippi, sort of the deep south. And the northern catalpa is native to the Mississippi River Valley from like Arkansas up to like Indiana. But both have um, expanded their range and both can be found um, in Virginia. Uh, planted as street trees and also um, naturalized into natural areas. One reason that people are sometimes familiar with the catalpa tree is that there's a certain caterpillar that lives pretty much exclusively on catalpa trees and that's a large caterpillar that is prized as a fish bait. Here's a southern magnolia, and it's living up to its name of uh, Grandiflora. That flower is taking up the whole screen. This one is a little bit past its prime. You can see all of the uh, stamens that have fallen off. They were ringed around the center pistil there. And you can see how the tulip poplar is in this family because the tulip poplar that we looked at, it has that sort of cone-like um, center structure and all of the stamen. The southern magnolia smells very fragrant and is really prized as a ornamental tree for its giant blooms. And the leaves are evergreen. They're thick and glossy and leathery, um, brown on the underside. And this is just a fine example of a tree that's uh, going to grow in the southern part, southeastern part of the state, but, but do very well planted outside of that area and um, just provide a lot of beauty to a uh, landscape. One of the really nice things about southern magnolia is the long bloom time. You can see here that there are blossoms just in their prime as well as brown ones that have already uh, ended their bloom as well as some buds of uh, flowers that have not yet bloomed. So this will bloom throughout the summer, which is a really nice feature of the Southern Magnolia. 
Well, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for joining me for 15 Minutes in the Forest. And don't forget to join us next week for Bill Worrell's segment. After next week, we're going to be switching to an every other week schedule. So make sure you check our flyer and we hope to see you every time we do 15 Minutes in the Forest.